Good morning, econ peeps. It is Thursday, but you should be watching this on April 1st, our first day of our new unit. Uh, hopefully all of you were able to complete that uh, unit 11 test. Um, this new unit, it will be our new unit number 12. Uh, you should have this on the Google Classroom, uh, what date the mods are due. Today we're going to cover mod 37, and the unit is called Economic Growth and Productivity. Today's mod, mod 37, is Economic Long Run Economic Growth. Um, by the end of this mod, this is my hillbilly whiteboards that we used in class. I've got some bigger ones. These are the three calculations that we've got to learn for mod 37, long run economic growth. Number one, how to calculate real GDP per capita. Number two, what is the rule of 70? Number three, how do you calculate productivity? So we'll go over each one of these uh, briefly. And we should, uh, this is a pretty easy mod, uh, and it shouldn't take too long. Uh, what I'm going to start off with is we have already done um, real GDP per capita. And, and why do we do that? And why do we care about that number when we did a whole paper on why GDP is not the be-all, end-all? It's so we can compare one country's growth and productivity to another country's. And it's also to help us compare stuff over time, like how are we doing over the last 20 years versus maybe the decade before that or maybe 100 years ago, how much more can we produce as a country? Um, and that's important because it helps us figure out how much we're growing, how much more stuff we can make than we used to be able to make, which is important. And the reason it's really important is because people are making babies. And if there's more people on this planet or in this country, we got to make more stuff. And so our productivity has to grow to keep pace with a growing population. Uh, the first thing, uh, real GDP per capita. As a reminder, that is my hit Billy whiteboard number two. Why do we care about GDP? Because it's a measure of all the stuff we can make. We can measure that either by spending SIG X or by our RIP method, all of this uh, spending by RIP um, or wealth, I'm sorry, spending by SIG X and um, income by RIP, wages, uh, rents, interests, and profits. Why do we care about real GDP when we're talking about real GDP per capita? Because we don't want to do inflation and have some crazy Venezuela inflation, inflation numbers to show that our country's way making more stuff than it really is. And last, per capita. Why do we care about that? Because we got to know how many people are in the country. One country has more people, it's going to make more stuff. But here's another reason. We, for this unit, we talk about if a country has 10 people and they have $100 of real GDP, our calculation for real GDP per capita is 100 total stuff made divided by 10 people. That's real GDP per capita, $10 a person. But what if the population output doubled, but we still only made $100 worth of stuff. Now, even though we made the same amount of stuff, our country is worse off. Why? Because now real GDP per capita is going to be $100, but divided by 20 people. Each person only has $5 worth of stuff for him or her. Your country's worse off. What does this show? You've got to constantly be growing how much stuff you can produce to keep up with a growing population or immigration. Next up, we want to talk about is this idea is, is growth good? And I'm not going to spend a lot, of, I just would have spent more time if we were in the classroom on this. I know a lot of people say, well, Mr. Kane, you know, the assumption here is that growth is good. And isn't that just the runaway capitalism? And why is growth good? I want you to put this in perspective. It's very easy, especially coming from, you know, one of the, one of the, the, top producing countries in the world to think, well, what about the bad parts of growth? You know, the industrial revolution, pollution and uh, water problems, and there um, could be poverty and things like that. We got to put this in perspective, you know, in 1800, the average person, uh, a woman probably owned two dresses, two shirts and one pair of shoes. The average person um, in 1800 has never traveled more than 15 miles outside of their home. The average person has never had fruits um, or very few fruits, let alone any fruits from anywhere else in the world. Um, life expectancy was about 40 years old. Uh, more likely to die from cholera, malaria, 
all sorts of diseases. Um, living space, minimal. Yes, you may have had, in theory, some cleaner air, but you've also had water problems where people are jumping human waste in the rivers that you use to feed uh, your family or drink from, right? Next up, and they say, well, Michigan, that's so far uh, uh, long ago. Well, there's a lot of pollution problems as of today. Agreed. But think about this. Between 1950 and today, most people in 1950 in America didn't have indoor toilets. Would you be willing to go back to that? Most people today, even if uh, below the poverty line, have a smartphone, a phone that is more powerful than the phone used uh, by the astronauts to get to the moon uh, when it comes to computing uh, powers, right? Uh, the average person today lives far longer, is better fed. Our number one problem, uh, health problem for the poor in America today is obesity, not uh, malnutrition. And so the things we have have made our life better at a cost, I would agree, but we've got to keep getting better in order to and make more stuff in order to satisfy an ever-growing population. And that's just basically the thrust of this whole module. Next up, do growth rates matter? They do. And countries grow and their economy grows, GDP grows at different rates for different countries. And one of the things economists do is they like to calculate how long would it take for a country, Ireland or China or America, to double their size of the economy. And then they compare that to, they can tell generally, exponentially, how long it will take for the population to double. And the idea is, is your growth, what you're going to be able to produce, the economy going to be double quicker than how long it's going to take your population to double. And so I've got our next hill, hillbilly whiteboard, which is the rule of 70. So it's a pretty easy calculation, and I'm not sure which economist came up with this, but if the rule of 70 says you take the number 70 and it's divided by your average growth rate for, we're going to assume, number of years in a row. So if your average growth rate is, let's say, 2% in a country, that means each year your GDP is growing by 2% on average year after year after year. You take 70, divide it by 2, and it, the answer would be it would take you 35 years to double your economy. So then what you want to know eventually is, well, how long is it going to take for your population to double, and are you exceeding that? So another example, let's just say if growth rate was 5%. You say, well, Mr. Kane, it's only 3% higher. So just even a small difference, though, can make a huge change, though, because if your growth rate was 5% instead of 2%, it would only take you 14 years to double your economy. So much quicker, so much more growth, so much change and betterment in your lives, um, in uh, health care, in your society, um, if you can do that. So little tiny changes in the average growth rate can have a huge impact on how quickly you can double the size of your income. Why is that? It goes back to like if you're taking consumer or anything else, it's that whole idea of compounding. If you had $100 and you made 10% interest, at the end of the year, you'd have $110. By the end of the second year, it would be $110 times another 10%. I don't know, I think that gets us to $121 and so on and so forth. It keeps compounding and growing. So even small incremental uh, advances in how much your average growth rate is can have huge long-lasting impacts on how quickly your country can grow its economy. Finally, we're on number three already, which is how do we measure productivity? There are three words that you have to memorize for how does productivity increase? And, and basically think three things that are going to be involved in this. And they all revolve around how we're going to grow that economy. And it's just productivity, productivity, productivity. That's the driving force. And then there's three factors that fo force us to hopefully become more productive. So the first one is going to be um, changes in physical capital. And, and we've talked about physical capital before. And physical capital is merely tools to make other tools. So they are computers, they are shovels, they are tow trucks, um, robots. 
These are all physical capital. Technically, it seems stupid, but some economists would say even humans are physical capital because humans can be used to make other things, right? Um, if, therefore, you increase physical capital, you're going to have give each of your workers more tools to, to work with to build uh, whatever they're going to build. You're going to become more productive. And so I think like an example before I go to the next two is, let's say we're in corona craziness and you foolishly decide you want to start helping out around the house instead of just laying around watching videos. And you say you're going to start helping mom and dad cook in the kitchen. That is awesome. And you should consider doing that. Let's go through these. If you could make mac and cheese and uh, a nice salad and um, some 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 sort of uh, dessert, key lime pie. Could you become more productive after doing this over a while? And there's three things that are going to get you to become more productive. You can do it better, cheaper, faster, better quality. Number one is we give you more physical capital. We give you uh, a microwave you didn't have before, a toaster oven. Maybe you have one um, a, a range and you open up and have two, or you have two uh, uh, double ovens, uh, something that adds more um, tools at your disposal to make uh, dinner. You are going to become more productive. You're going to be able to create more stuff. Number two would be human capital. And we've talked about human capital. If your country is going to invest in its people, its humans, its citizens, and by that I mean making them smarter, they will become more productive. So what happens if you started watching cooking shows and picking up topics from watching Chopped or something like that or diners, drive-ins, and dives? What happens if you started reading online recipes? What happens if you went to e-learning um, cooking school and picked up a whole bunch of new tips on either new ways to make food or faster ways to make them or better ways to chop things to do faster? That's all human capital. That would make your society more productive. And the last one is the most important, so we'll put stars around that. The last one is increases in technology. And again, the trick question on the AP uh, folks is trying to trick you in is what is physical capital versus what is technology. So physical capital is the tool itself. Technology is making the existing tool better. So technology could be, uh, physical capital could be a computer. Changes in better technologies could be faster computing speeds or more uh, storage space or uh, better graphics or bigger screens, right? It could be, is, is, is the physical capital could be a shovel. Technology changes could be a better design shovel that takes a little more stress off your back so you can shovel longer, right? This is the number one driver of productivity. Countries that invest in more technology typically has the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to increasing your productivity rates and therefore how much you can make your growth. And so there's one calculation for that which I had on the board, which is now what we're going to focus on is productivity is going to be our um, amount of materials or GDP, amount of stuff we've made divided by the number of workers in your population. So therefore, what we want to measure is, okay, you know, Ireland may have so many people, India has so many people, Germany has so many people, but what we really want to focus on is productivity is, let's really focus on each worker in those countries. So a lot of times they'll say productivity of an American worker versus a French worker versus a German worker versus a uh, Vietnamese worker, right? And so now the focus becomes on, on how much stuff you can make, but based on divided by the number of workers, not the entire population of your country, because we don't really care about little babies or old retired people. And well, again, what drives how much stuff they can make is how productive each person is. And those factors um, influence that. I think that is it um, for I have for this whole thing. Um, the only thing I will say on this is I've also, in the Google Classroom, I've added, I think it's like five or six questions that shouldn't take you more than uh, less than 10 minutes to do. And you will fill those out um, and send those in to me through uh, the Google Classroom classwork. 
Um, make sure for next class we'll have uh, two mods to do. Uh, it's like 38 and 39. Um, just so you know, I believe the AP folks are, at least as of right now, are not changing the format of the AP econ test. They are the gov test, for those of you in gov. Um, but I hear they may be cutting out the very last section of what we have not covered yet in econ, which would actually be good because then we would actually be able to do maybe a little reviewing or practicing um, down the home stretch rather than working all the way up to the end. Um, we've got a quick turnaround. This unit is short, and then we've got a couple of miscellaneous things we're going to do after that, and then we've hit everything. I think that we need to hit um, in preparation for getting ready for macro and micro tests. So hopefully everybody's safe, everybody's feeling healthy, everybody's taking care of themselves. Uh, if you have questions, uh, my plan is, if this works, is I'm going to set up a Google chat room or something for our first day of class, which is that Wednesday, April 1st. I will hopefully, if I can figure this out, send out an invite to everybody. What I want you to do is, after what we lectured on today, if there's things you have questions on or you're not sure about, you can join that chat and ask me the questions and you can type them in and we'll have everybody wants so I don't have to answer the same questions 15 times. Um, if you don't have any and you uh, want to join in and just listen, that's great. Or if you don't want to join in, that's completely fine. Um, I don't care if you come in or not. It's totally up to you. I don't want you to waste time. I know you got a lot of craziness going on here. So I will try to set that up for, I'm going to try for, I'm thinking like 2 o'clock on April 1st, is that if you're available, you can jump in, ask questions, and then jump out when you're done. Um, if you don't need anything, don't worry about jumping in. And if I don't see you, I will see you the following class, which will be Friday the April 3rd. Bye. Thank you.